Welcome, welcome, welcome back, y'all. We are here and I'm so excited about my next guest because he is here to share some critical information that all of us women need to hear. Dr. John Lippman is a medical doctor. He's board certified in interventional radiologist and renowned author authority in the non-surgical treatment of uterine fibroids. He is the founder and medical director of Atlanta Fibroid Center. Y'all in Atlanta, perk up, a state-of-art medical facility specialized in non-surgical non treatment of uterine fibroids. That's non-surgical uterine fibroids. Uh, he has cared for women from throughout the world. He's an adjunct clinical assistant pro uh, professor at the Department of OBGYN at Morehouse School of Medicine. He is here to talk to us about how and why to avoid a hysterectomy. I so wish I had met him years ago, but I am hoping he is he, well, he is here today to help others to avoid losing their uterus to a hysterectomy. So that being said, we have none other than Dr. John Littman hitting the stage. How are you? Yay! Well, thank I'm excited. You. Thanks so much for having me. I mean, you're the second supermodel that had already had a hysterectomy that uh, still can talk about fibroids and fibroids. You can still talk about UFE even though you had a hysterectomy. Beverly Johnson here in Atlanta is also someone we've worked with. And um, I think I have to sign up for your master class because we're one of the best kept secrets in medicine. And maybe it wouldn't be that way if I signed up for your master class. Yeah, you need to sign up because it's time to stop being the best kept secret. You know I'm all about visibility. But I can tell you, I want to make sure that no other woman I lost mine at 25, oh. and you know what? You oh. still can get a fibroid, y'all. You oh. still can get one. So I'm going to leave the stage because I am so, I'm going to have my own notes in the background so we can chat afterwards. Excellent. Well, thanks again to Kern, and uh, it's a really an honor to speak to everyone this evening. And I look forward to the conversation later tonight you know, is that we can talk about some of these things specifically, because I know every time I speak and I speak all over the country on this, it always generates a lot of questions, but um, time to dive right in. The most yes. dangerous phrase in the English language, according to Grace Hopper, is it's we've always done it that way. And that's what's going on with hysterectomy. We've, we've just kind of always done it. No one has ever challenged it. Um, and in my opinion, hysterectomy should be an absolutely last resort option for women with symptomatic fibroids. Um, unfortunately, today it's being presented as a first line option and um, it's been that way for a long time. So I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to end that practice. Just to give you a little history of hysterectomy, hysterectomy started in the 19th century and they had a 70% death rate. A lot of that was due to um, very beginnings of anesthesia. So, um, and it was done most commonly, uh, interestingly for a condition called hysteria, which is a whole nother topic that I talk about. Um, hysteria was a mental condition that only occurred in women. Um, hysteria, hyster from the root word uterus, like in hysterectomy, was only in women. And it was a way to explain away behaviors by women that made men uncomfortable, women that were precocious, women that talked back to men, women that were gregarious or uh, had unfemale-like behaviors according to the men of the day. They would be labeled with hysteria and often either go to an asylum or get a hysterectomy when hysterectomy arrived on the scene. And this practice be, became prevalent doing hysterectomies. Um, hysteria, fortunately, isn't a medical condition any longer. We recognize that that was silly. 
Um, but it is now being replaced or has been replaced for removal of benign fibroids. In fact, um, Fannie Lou Hammer, um, and I don't have to speak to this audience about the significance of, of her and in, in women's rights and in, in, in health inequities, um, there was a lot of sterilization that was going on involuntarily um, and it got the moniker Mississippi appendectomy. Um, for women that got hysterectomies um, that were deemed unfit to reproduce and they would get involuntary sterilizations. And so the practice of hysterectomy has been extraordinarily prevalent in the United States. Um, and so surely things have changed now, nowadays, that just doesn't happen anymore, does it? Well, unfortunately it does. Uh, we have the highest hysterectomy rate in the world and if you divide the United States into quarters, the southeastern United States leads the way. And I'm here in Atlanta. Um, it's the second most common surgery performed in the United States. That was a, rather surprising to me because half the population is men, and yet it's still the second most common surgery we do. And the most common reason why we do it is not cancer of the uterus, that would be appropriate. Um, it's for these benign fibroids. Why are we doing this? No one is challenging this. It, it's a big multi-billion dollar industry. Some say upwards of 30 billion uh, when you take lost wages and disability and time away from work uh, into this. And the average age of hysterectomy in this country is less than 40. These are young women. In fact, I've met in my travels way too many women less than 30 years of age have already had a hysterectomy for fibroids. It's tragic. The uterus is not the appendix. Removing it has consequences. And I would say that the cure with hysterectomy is often worse than the disease itself, fibroids. Well, there is a common myth that I hear every day in my office at the Atlanta Fibroid Center uh, from patients saying to me, my gynecologist told me once I was done having children that I didn't need my uterus anymore. And that's, that's just false. Um, there are significant consequences for women that have undergone hysterectomy. It can affect women psychologically, like a man being castrated. It can affect women sexually, loss of libido, loss of orgasm. There's a lot of urinary leaking after hysterectomy. You take this enlarged fibroid filled uterus, which they often describe as a certain size pregnancy, 14 weeks, 16 weeks, 18 weeks, this enlarged pregnant sized uterus and you remove it and you weaken the pelvic floor muscles. And now these young women are wearing diapers. We know there's a lot of bone loss after hysterectomy. And now there's good evidence to suggest there is cardiovascular effects. And the younger the hysterectomy occurs, the higher the risk of increased risk of hypertension, high blood pressure, heart attack, stroke, what have you. There was a book written by a woman, uh, Lisa Cloutiel Steele. She was a young woman in, her, woman in her 30s that wrote a book called Misinformed Consent. And um, if anyone was interested in about this story, um, is a number they interviewed a, thousands of women that had undergone hysterectomy uh, for fibroids. And the common thread that she was hearing from hundreds of these women was this feeling of betrayal. Um, we weren't told what would happen after hysterectomy. This is a quote from a gynecologist in New York City. He's, he says that 90% of all hysterectomies are unnecessary. Um, certainly the majority, the vast majority are, I don't know if it's 90%, but certainly the significant majority are, and they can have long lasting physical, emotional, sexual consequences, as I just mentioned. And obviously it can undermine your health and well being. It lacks a sensitivity to the needs of the female patient. It's likened to castration, as I mentioned. Considering the importance of the uterus, and that seems to be the problem here, uh, a lot of our physicians are not considering the importance of the uterus. A disorder should have to be very serious, like cancer to justify removing it. Unfortunately, with fibroids, that's not the case. Here are a couple examples of uh, pictures of 
advertisements uh, for adult diapers. Now, when I think of adult diapers, I think of grandpa and grandma, but clearly this is, these two examples are attractive, young African-American women. Um, and, you know, Depends is from a big company. I'm not sure if it's Kimberly Clark or Colgate or Palmolive or one of the big companies. They have very expensive Madison Avenue marketers. They know who their target is. It's young African-American women who have had hysterectomy. Um, and that's just tragic. Here is a, an article uh, from WebMD about the increased cardiovascular risk for women undergoing hysterectomy. There was a study from the Mayo Clinic a number of years ago that looked at a thousand women that, were, that had been suffering with fibroids and the average time for them to seek treatment was over three and a half years and a quarter of them waited over five years and they were totally perplexed by this. And when they drilled down further, they found out why. Women don't want surgery and they're not given any other option besides surgery, like this outstanding option, uterine fibroid embolization, UFE, that I'm about to talk about in just a moment. This is a survey from a few years ago that uh, most people had never heard of this UFE procedure. Um, even fibroid patients had never heard of it. Um, those that did hear about it uh, didn't hear about it from their gynecologist. Uh, and a number of people felt that the only treatment option for them was hysterectomy. And again, that's just false. Well, what are fibroids? They are benign, non-cancerous tumors. They're the most common pelvic tumor seen in women. And up to 80% of African-American women have these benign tumors. It's common in all women, but it's three times more common in African-American women than their Caucasian counterparts. African-American women get fibroids at a younger age. They tend to be bigger, more numerous fibroids, and therefore they're more likely to be symptomatic and they're more likely to get a hysterectomy, unfortunately, and that's what we're trying to end. Um, and they also are more likely to be in the hospital and have a higher hospital mortality rate. They're the most common reason why women have heavy periods. And sometimes women, they've been bleeding heavily for so long, they don't realize what's abnormal. Um, if you change more frequently than every three hours or so, that's not normal. If you're changing more than one pad at a time or more than eight in a day, that's certainly not normal. If you get episodes of blood gushing out or flooding or passing clots bigger than a quarter or getting accidents in blood, these are all obviously too heavy, um, even if you've been doing it for a long time. Um, these heavy periods lead to what's called anemia, a medical condition where there is a deficit of iron and hemoglobin from all this lost blood. Um, and some of the clinical signs of anemia include being tired and weak, particularly around the menstrual. They may get lightheaded or dizzy, get this kind of brain fog, cloudy thinking. Um, they may get palpitations, their heart races because it has to work harder because there are less circulating red cells. They might chew or crave ice or might chew or crave inedible things like dirt or clay or chalk. Um, they may get migraine-like headaches, uh, their hair thins, uh, even losing hair. Um, but all of that is reversible. You can treat the anemia by treating the fibroids. There are also bulk-related symptoms with fibroids. These fibroids are hard and firm. They're like rocks and they press on things and they can press on pelvic nerves to cause abdominal or pelvic pain, um, pain that can radiate into the back, the low back, the buttock, down the legs, this sciatica, just like you would get if you threw out your back, the same sciatica pain can be from fibroids. Uh, if the fibroids are near the cervix, they can cause painful intercourse. Um, if they're in the back of the uterus, they can cause constipation by pressing on the colon. And in the front of the uterus, they'll press on the bladder. So patients will urinate more frequently than normal. They might wake up at night, even leak urine. Some of the treatment options for fibroids, um, many patients will get placed on medicines first. Uh, the medical therapy for fibroids is essentially pretty poor. Um, it's tried, uh, but it's not very good. Um, 
One of the medicines, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicine like ibuprofen is called tranexamic acid. And we use a fair amount of that in the office. Um, it has special effects to light and flow. And it's, it's a very close relative of ibuprofen. Uh, there are a lot of patients that are placed on some form of hormonal therapy, whether it's birth control pills or a progestin containing IUD or maybe an implant. Um, these hormonal agents is a double-edged sword. While they will tend to lighten flow, at least temporarily for a short term, um, we don't know where fibroids come from, but they grow with hormones, particularly estrogen, but also progesterone. And what's in a birth control pill, but estrogen and progesterone. So while it may work for a while, in the background, you're pouring gas on a fire and these fibroids will grow more rapidly than they otherwise would and they become a problem. And then it goes into the surgical category, depending on a woman's fertility. If she's interested in fertility, possibly or definitely, they get offered a myomectomy, surgically cutting out some of the fibroids. And that's the big problem with myomectomy. Not only is it surgical, but they don't get them all out. And hysterectomy, losing your uterus. And Unfortunately, this non-surgical option, UFE, uterine fibroid embolization, gets overlooked. It doesn't get mentioned because the gynecologists are not trained in UFE. I'm a different type of physician trained in these minimally invasive procedures done from the inside. I'm an interventional radiologist, and that's the kind of physician that you would need to see to talk about this non-surgical option, UFE. UFE is also known as UAE, uterine artery embolization. It's the same exact procedure, completely non-surgical and outpatient. It takes 30 to 40 minutes. Patients sleep through it, but they're not put to sleep like an operation with general anesthesia. The sedation is much nicer. It's IV and local. Um, all the fibroids get knocked out. Um, the fibroids will start to die, and as they die, they soften and they shrink, and as the fibroids soften and shrink and die off, the woman's symptoms fade away. She's discharged uh, the same day of the procedure, three, maybe four hours after the procedure. The recovery is five to seven days versus a lengthy recovery from surgery. Often the patients from surgery, hysterectomy in particular, they're out of work for eight weeks. Um, our patients go home not only with their uterus, they go home with a Band-Aid. That's it, a Band-Aid at the top of their right leg where we go in. Um, patients can have children after UFE. That's a, another myth that people are told, well, if you're interested in UFE, or if you're interested in fertility, you can't consider UFE. That's just not true. Um, and every insurance covers uh, UFE. I've been doing it here in Atlanta for over 25 years. All of the insurance carriers cover UFE. The results are outstanding. Um, success rate of 90% or so. Um, it's a very low complication rate, much lower in incidence and much lower in severity compared to being cut open surgically, um, as you might imagine. There is no limit to the size or number of these fibroids. I hear that commonly. That's another myth. Um, and the recurrence, because you typically knock out all the fibroids, the chance of recurrence is very unusual. I mean, Occasionally, patients will be treated a second time, but even in those, quote, worst case scenarios, two of these UFE procedures is still way better than one surgery. And myomectomy, I commonly see in the office women that have had two or three, I've seen as many as five, but a lot of two and three myomectomy patients coming to me for the next procedure. The recurrence of myomectomy is 11% per year. It's very high. Over, that means over half the women will recur within five years, over a third within three years. Um, so with UFE, you finally get the relief you're looking for. And there are a lot of women we could be helping, these silent sufferers that don't know about UFE. They're sitting on the sidelines suffering miserably with fibroids. They just don't want surgery. I don't blame them, but they don't know of this UFE option. They avoid the risks and long recovery of surgery, and importantly, they get to keep their uterus, something that is really, uh, unfortunately, underappreciated by a lot of physicians. Um, and that 
is translated to patients. The patients don't feel, well, I don't need my uterus anymore. My doctor told me I'm done having my kids. Um, these are a couple of schematics. Um, on the left-hand diagram, you can see here, the entry point is at the top of the right leg. And then under X-ray, we negotiate this little tiny catheter into each uterine artery one at a time. There's a left and a right uterine artery and they each branch like a tree, getting smaller and smaller branches till you get out to the leaves. The fibroids are the leaves of the tree and I can direct these particles to the fibroids. I know what size those tiny peripheral branches are that are feeding each and every fibroid. I can plug them up and then the fibroids will die. And as mentioned, as they die, they will soften and shrink. And as that occurs, a woman's symptoms uh, will start to fade away. And we see everybody back three months after the procedure. And by then, all the fibroids should be dead and the patient should be typically a new woman. All the symptoms will be at least significantly better if not OMG better. Um, this is pictures from an actual procedure. It may be very hard to see, but the catheter um, is in the right uterine artery and we're injecting contrast. This is kind of our roadmap. And you can kind of get the impression that there are a number of circles here. Each one of these circles is a fibroid and the fibroid blood supply is at the periphery of each of these circles. And then after the embolic, the particles are injected, you don't see those branches anymore. You see the uterine artery right here, but you don't see any of the fibroid branches anymore. The fibroids are, are about to die. Here's a MRI picture. Uh, we, we don't rely on ultrasound. Ultrasound is kind of a very low resolution imaging tool. Um, the vast majority of patients have had a pelvic ultrasound with a gynecologist. It's okay to diagnose fibroids with, but we need more sophisticated imaging. And the MRI is spectacular. Here you can see from the side view, we're looking at the, the woman from the side, like a profile. The front of her is on the left. You can see the bladder here in white, the uterus right behind it. And within the uterus, this big black circle, this is a big orange sized fibroid that's causing all sorts of misery. Um, it's distorting the lining of her uterus. She's having horribly heavy periods. And then three months later, you can barely see that fibroid or all of her symptoms are gone. Here's another patient, again, a dramatic example of a very big fibroid at the top of her uterus, we're again looking from the side view, and you can barely see where that tiny dead remnant of a fibroid is located, and she's thrilled. All of her symptoms are gone, and she also lost that pregnant poochiness. Nothing worse than having people ask you if you're pregnant when you're not. The advantages of this UFE procedure are pretty obvious. It treats all the fibroids simultaneously. It's very effective. It's minimally invasive. Patients go home with a Band-Aid. Um, the complication rate is extremely rare. Um, it's a very short recovery. A number of our patients are going back to work, particularly if they're working from home during COVID within a matter of several days. Um, it's a one-time procedure typically, unlike myomectomy. It's safer than surgery. It's less invasive. The recovery is shorter. There's no surgical wound. There's no general anesthesia. There's no hospital. Uh, it's all done as outpatient. There's no blood loss. I can treat patients that either can't receive blood products or don't want to. Um, their hemoglobins can be very low. Um, they would never operate on these patients, but we can do UFE without any issue whatsoever. Again, it's covered by all insurance, and importantly, you get to keep your uterus. Um, disadvantages, uh, the fibroids shrink significantly. Uh, they're not removed from the body, so they're still there, but if you think about it, most women that have fibroids um, have them their whole life. Uh, most women don't have any significant symptoms. These fibroids are called passenger fibroids. They kind of ride along in the uterus. They don't bother the woman. The woman doesn't have to bother them, and they die with them. What we're doing is taking fibroids that are very significant. They're not passengers. They're causing horrible symptoms and converting them into smaller dead passengers that won't bother the woman ever again. Um, occasionally the fibroids aren't completely dead and that could require retreatment occasionally. Again, very unlikely. It's performed under x-ray guidance. So there's a very small x-ray dose like getting a CAT scan or a mammogram. Um, some women won't menstruate ever again after the UFE. 
Now, I've never seen that happen in any woman. I've done over 9,000 of these. I've never seen that happen to anybody under 40 years of age. Even in the next category, 40 to 45 is one to 2%. It's not till you get above 50 that you really start seeing it. And even then it's 20, 25% above 50. Um, and those women, frankly, they start laughing when I say there, might, there may be a chance you might not menstruate again. Um, they just immediately burst into laughter because they've been bleeding horribly. And when you're 50, you're not interested typically in fertility. Um, about 5% of women will temporarily pass some fibroid material vaginally, and that's okay as long as they know about it. It's, it's temporary, maybe last a cycle or two. And a very rare patient, we've needed some help to actually deliver some of that fibroid material uh, through like a DNC. Um, so compared to hysterectomy, um, hysterectomy, obviously you're in the hospital, it's under general anesthesia, it's a major procedure. There's a 30% complication rate, usually bleeding and transfusion. It could be wound issues. You could nick bowel, bladder, or ureter during surgery. It's, it can be a mess. Uh, there's long recovery, even with laparoscopic, and you lose your uterus. As I mentioned, there are consequences for that. UFE is outpatient. You go home with a Band-Aid, brief recovery, and you keep all your parts. On the horizon, we're, I started a nonprofit 501c3, freefromfibroids.org. Uh, um, we're trying to get HR 2007 passed. It's important legislation, uh, trying to get fibroid research, which is so necessary. Um, it was started uh, a number of years ago by uh, I Iowa Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones, who unfortunately passed away. Um, and her torch was picked up by Vice President Harris and her counterpart in Congress, Yvette Clark from New York. Um, it directs the NIH to do really important research into fibroids. We still don't know where fibroids come from. It's really uh, tragic that we haven't spent more money uh, on fibroid research. It also directs the CDC to educate the public and physicians about fibroid treatment options, hopefully UFE as well. Um, so we're not left out of that conversation. So you can go to freefromfibroids.org. Uh, we'd love your support. It's nothing financial. We just want numbers of people to support it. Um, you can go to Instagram at free from fibroids foundation. That's a mouthful. Um, and also show your support. So in conclusion, in my opinion, hysterectomy should be relegated to the option of last resort for symptomatic fibroids. Women with symptomatic fibroids are entitled to know all their options, not just the surgical ones. UFE is an outstanding non-surgical option. It has a 25-year track record of safety and efficacy. It works, it's tremendous. Um, every patient that is considering surgery for symptomatic fibroids should also be informed about UFE. Patients aren't being informed. Um, not informing these patients really adds to the general mistrust in all women, but particularly African-American women who disproportionately suffer with fibroids and also given their history um, with Henrietta Lacks, with you know, so many others um, that I mentioned, um, this Mississippi appendectomy and the Tuskegee experiment. It's, it's just, it, it's heartbreaking. Um, please consider supporting HR 2007 and freefromfibroids.org. Um, thanks for your attention. I'll be back later on uh, this evening for a, a round table where you'll be able to ask specific questions. Um, this is my office number, our website, atlii.com, our Instagram, dr underscore my last name. We have a Facebook page, it's under the parent organization, Atlanta Interventional Institute. We have a YouTube channel with over 150 videos on fibroids and UFE. So if you go to YouTube and look up Atlanta Fibroid Center, you'll see that. Um, July is Fibroid Awareness Month here in Georgia and some of the other states in the United States. And our hashtag, as you can see here, this is Freddie the Falcon. We're in Atlanta, so we're Falcon fans. Um, don't lose your you. And this is our mayor. Keisha Lance Bottoms helping out. Don't lose your you. 
and the bass player for the greatest band ever, all time, ever, Earth, Wind, and Fire, from White, Blue, for you. Thanks. Wow. So, you know, I can't let you just go like that. We got to we gotta get some of these questions on air while we got people tuned in. Y'all, if you have not marked your, set your uh, timer, we are going to be back at the Candid Conversation and Cocktails tonight with Dr. John Lippman. Uh, but, of course, I want to ask some things right now because I think it's this is just very, very important information. And I think the more women that hear it, uh, we can we can definitely start attacking and driving down these numbers of so many, particularly young women. So let me ask you, on average, from what you know, how many women, and I noticed you said a lot of young black women are uh, losing their uterus. What's the What's the percentage? What, you know, what, what's the numbers that we're looking at? We're looking at numbers of like 750,000 every year <gasps> and most commonly fibroids. So roughly every working day in this country, 3,000 women lose their uterus every wow. day, every working day. Every work. And, we're, and, and they're losing it because of a fibroid. Most, most commonly fibroids. And one or two of them don't survive the surgery. They don't wake up. Really? And that's just something happens? I mean, what? In surgery. That doesn't happen with UFE, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Patients, this is a much safer, much less invasive, much shorter recovery. Keep all your parts. It's, uh, we got to just stop doing this. Just because we've been doing it for a long time, doesn't make it right. And I'm hoping that we can finally um, get people to stop this multi-billion dollar. Wow. Enterprise. Wow. So so I, it's about a doubt. That's what you just said. It yeah. Is it's uh, imagine a world where everyone has candles. Everybody has candles. We're using candles for light. Everyone, there's a lot of companies out there that are supplying these candles. Um, you know, big organizations making the candles, distributing the candles. Everything's revolving around the candle. Suddenly, somebody comes to town with a light bulb. Um, UFE is the light bulb. UFE is Thomas Edison. It's very disruptive to this big candle industry, but we've, we've got to do it. We've got to start. Wow. So, so you've been doing this particular procedure for 25 years. Right. In fact, uh, we were interviewed in the Wall Street Journal, front page Wall Street Journal, August of 2004. The article, you can look it up. It's called Silent Treatment. Hysterectomy alternative goes unmentioned to many women. And that was August of 2004. Nothing has changed. Absolutely nothing. So, so, and it's, can you describe, so what is the procedure that you do? Because we all know what the hysterectomy procedure yeah, the, the is. The UFE procedure, I take a little tiny catheter, it's the size of a piece of spaghetti, and I can steer it under x-ray into each of the uterine arteries one at a time, because there's two, there's one on each side of the uterus. And then those, those uterine arteries branch like a tree getting smaller and smaller, the fibroids are the leaves of the tree, and I know what size those tiny branches, and I can deliver these tiny particles to plug up those small fibroid branches. The big trunk and the main branches of the uterus stay open. Um, the uterus stays alive, and we've had numerous children after UFE. In fact, our births are typically full-term and vaginal. If you have a myomectomy, the surgery, you're going to get a C-section, no vaginal birth. But... Um, so all the fibroids without a blood supply will die. And as they do, they soften and shrink. And as that occurs, a woman's symptoms start to go away. Wow. And what? And, and so I'm sure you mentioned this. What are some of the symptoms that you have that you now won't have to have once you have the procedure? 
typically this, I mean, the most common reason why women have heavy periods is due to fibroids. And it can be horrific, blood literally running down their legs, wearing all sorts of extra pads, extra gear, extra clothes, double up on pads. They can't, it interferes. Everything revolves around their menstrual. They, they might not work a couple days a month. They may not have relations. They may, they may have to know where every bathroom is. They can't sleep on the good linens. They're afraid to visit their friend's you know, place because they don't want to sit on their furniture. Everything wow. they do, work, play, everything revolves around this horrible menstrual each month, month after month after month, and they're losing more blood than they can replace. So it's physically taxing. They're weak. They're tired. They're just worn out, and they're worn out mentally. It's just... It's horrible. It's it's a horrible existence for these women, and yet we have the answer, but nobody knows about it. So you're saying the whole reason why we are still having women, particularly young women, have these massive surgeries is because companies are trying to make dollars. What were the OBGYN doctors adding this solution? Well, certainly, I mean, we, I don't know at what point you say, you know, most, we know that most gynecologists don't mention this to, men, you know, to their patients. Most, mm -hmm. some do, and we see referrals from gynecologists that, you know, do refer to us uh, and others that do this procedure, but most, and many studies have proven it, most gynecologists don't mention it. In fact, a very prominent gynecologist, we, I just, looked at this today, it was out in Everyday Health. You can look it up. It, it was posted very recently in Everyday Health about the uh, f about fibroids and treating fibroids. They listed all the treatments from fibroids and they quoted this expert that I know personally at the Cleveland Clinic, prominent gynecologist, didn't mention UFE. I mean, it's outrageous. They mentioned hysterectomy, myomectomy, birth control, all these other things. They didn't mention UFE. It's a travesty. It's a purposeful suppression of information that just shouldn't be. I mean, this is, you know, at what point after 25 years, they all know about this procedure. They all know about it. I've presented at their meetings. They, it's in their literature. It's published. We, you know, they, the American College of OBGYN back in 2008, finally, after we started doing this in 1995, by 2008, at least the American College of OBGYN gave it its seal of approval. But that doesn't mean their rank and file is going to tell patients. It's just they gave it the approval from the corporate headquarters. So the, reason, so the reason why they don't teach this procedure is because there's more money in cutting people open? Well, they're surgeons. Gynecologists are trained as surgeons. They are surgeons, and surgeons like to operate, period. That's they're not trained in UFE. It's a different medical specialty. We invented this technology, um, and it's a much better, safer, less invasive approach. But because the gynecologists don't do it, they somehow have convenient memory. They forget about mentioning it, or they'll say, "Well, you know, your fibroids are too big or too many. You, you wouldn't be a candidate or whatever myth." Um, some will tell their patients, but most do not. And that's why nobody knows about this procedure. It's a real shame. It's, as I say, we're the best kept secret. UFE is one of the best medical procedures ever to come along for women. I put it up there in terms of significance with the mammogram and the pap smear. And you don't mention it as a gynecologist. I don't know how you sleep at night. Well, I can personally say uh, as a person who's actually has a fibroid right now uh, that um, the gynecologists have no intentions of mentioning it. I mean, there is no, is not on their plate, is not anything they're considering and they never, they don't give you that option. And so as a client, you're just kind of stuck with whatever they tell you. And so um, the other thing, and I want to dive deeper tonight. So I'm sorry, y'all. You're going to have to come to Candid Conversation to really get down to some other things that you mentioned. And I know you mentioned the Tuskegee experience, yep. the Mississippi Apodep Depimy, um, 
I want to I want to dive deep on that because yeah, imagine I spoke at Tuskegee. Imagine a white male physician talking to a, a large audience of young African American women about the Tuskegee experiment. In fact, my the my premise of my talk was this is the Tuskegee experiment of our of our time. Wow. Did y'all I, I know y'all heard that out in the Facebook world. So I'm just gonna say you're gonna have to come back if you want to dive deeper because we're gonna talk about that. There's some deep if you haven't heard of the um the um to, well not just Tuskegee but the Mississippi epidemic, uh you need to tune in tonight. You need to join the conversation. Bring your wine. Dr. Dr. Lipman already has his ready for tonight conversation. Yes. He, look, y'all, a bottle signed by Cool in the Game. How cool is that? Wow. Champagne. Champagne. Oh, my goodness. It, it's, his, it's his brand. Oh, my. Oh, it's his brand. I didn't know that. Cool. Okay. So, y'all, y'all got to come on. Make sure now we're getting ready to go into Lisa Nichols, but you want to make sure that you show back up tonight in the powerhouse in the power up summit zoom room. You want to be there tonight. Bring your glass and let's get busy talking and y'all let's share some stories and talk to Dr. Lipman and really get your mind around the fact that you have options and he's bringing us the options now. I didn't have that option at 25. I lost my uterus at 25, but I want to stop women from doing that. We didn't have, I didn't have the option. And then, so there are many of you that don't have to suffer. I know several people in the last several years that have lost their uterus because of fibroid which throws your body all out of whack. So let's get busy. Dr. Uh, Lippman, I'm looking forward to talking to you later and really diving deeper. So y'all, I'll see you over in the Power Up Summit Zoom room at 8.45, 8.45. But right now, we're headed over to talk to none other than Lisa Nichols, international motivational speaker, Y'all don't want to miss her. Y'all know she's always dropping and pouring into us. So just like Dr. Lipman has powered us up to get healthier and to have better choices, she's going to help power us up and lift up our life as well. So I'm Kern Cherry. I am so excited that y'all have tuned in. But now it's time to power up with Lisa Nichols.